The Gospel according to Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, we are worshiping gathered around my kitchen table and gathered around your computers, TVs, or mobile devices in your living rooms, kitchens, home offices, or wherever you prefer to sit when watching YouTube on your phones. On this first Sunday of Advent, at the beginning of this season of waiting for Christ to come, it is hard to believe how much of 2020 we have spent waiting waiting for the virus to come here, waiting for lockdowns to start, waiting for stores and restaurants to reopen, waiting to resume in-person worship, waiting for a vaccine, waiting for things to get back to normal, and waiting some more as things shut down again, as we realize how bad we can be at waiting. While the virus has spread and pushed our healthcare and society to the limit, we have also seen our society to begin to wake up to the evils of systemic racism in a way that hasn't really happened before. So, we have been waiting for justice for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the hundreds of other unarmed black people who have been killed by the police this year and every year. We have been waiting for protests to end in change instead of violence. We have been waiting for our country to finally stop thinking of those of us who are black, indigenous, or people of color as them and realize they are us. And because of the virus, many among us have been waiting to see how long we will be unemployed or underemployed, waiting to see if we will have enough money to put food on the table and pay our rent, waiting to see if more help will be coming from a stimulus bill or from a local food pantry or church. It seems like we are waiting for so many things. We have no idea how long we will have to keep waiting. In today's gospel, Jesus talks about a coming time when, after there has been much suffering, the Son of Man comes in power and glory, sending angels to gather all the elect into heaven. There will be signs before this happens, like the first green leaves of the spring telling us that summer is near. But we must stay awake and keep watch, because we do not know when this will happen. Mark was writing his version of the gospel about 40 or 50 years after Jesus was crucified and rose. At that time, the people of Occupy Palestine were in open revolt against the powerful Roman Empire. The revolt ended when the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. For many early Christians who thought of themselves as Jews and considered the temple a center of worship, this seemed like a clear sign of the end times before Jesus' imminent return. After the temple was destroyed, those early Christians began to worship in a different way. 
Instead of basing their worship on Jewish practices in the temple, worship focused on the home and was inspired by Jesus at the Last Supper when he instituted Holy Communion. Early Christians began to gather in people's homes. As they gathered to worship, they would be welcomed into the home. Then someone would preach the good news of Jesus Christ, perhaps accompanied by a reading from one of Paul's letters or one of the early gospel accounts, if they were fortunate enough to have copies. After hearing the word, they would gather at the table to share a meal. Everyone would have brought offerings of food, so there would be plenty for everyone to eat. During the meal, someone, often the person who preached, would say a prayer of thanksgiving, remembering Jesus' words at that Last Supper, and everyone would share in communion. After the meal, any food that remained would be distributed to the poor in the community. Think how similar that is to how we still worship. In the church building, or on days like today when we all gather as the church in our homes to worship. First, we gather and greet each other. Then we hear scripture and the gospel and the word proclaimed by the day's preacher. Then we collect offerings and share the meal of communion. Finally, we are sent out to share the good news and the gifts we received through the offering. I suspect that in that early church, many who worshiped in their homes were waiting too. They waited for the temple to be rebuilt, for the Son of Man to come in power and glory to end their suffering and fix things, putting them back the way they should be. Indeed, they may even have expected this because it had happened before. The first temple was built by King Solomon around 1000 BC and destroyed by the Babylonians in the year 586 BC, when the population of Judah was taken into exile in Babylon. Prophets like Isaiah in today's first reading proclaimed that a savior would come and the temple would be rebuilt. Seventy years later, after Babylon was itself conquered by Persia, the Jews were allowed to return and rebuild the temple. Just as the Persians conquered Babylon, many expected Jesus to return, leading an army to save them from the Romans. But that isn't what happened. The early Christians who focused on waiting for things to go back to the way they were were focused on the wrong part of today's gospel. Those who waited for the status quo to be restored, for everything to be normal again, they were the slaves who were sleeping when the master returned. Beware, keep alert, Jesus says, and then compares waiting for his return to slaves, each doing their work to prepare for the master's return. Paul, a self-professed slave to Christ, certainly did not wait passively for his master's return. Paul went on several missionary journeys and wrote many letters to the churches he started and visited. And yes, we know from his early letters that many of those churches did meet in people's homes. In today's reading from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, Paul gives thanks for the many spiritual gifts, such as speech and knowledge, that have blessed their church. He knows that Christ will continue to strengthen them in those gifts so that they will be ready when the Lord's day comes. So, as we all wait for the pandemic to end, what are we waiting for? If we are waiting for everything to go back to normal, then we are no different from those early Christians who passively waited for Jesus to come with an army of angels to clear out the Romans, build the temple, and fix everything wrong in the world for us. Yes, going back to normal would mean that we don't have to wear masks everywhere. We can shop and eat at restaurants. We can go to football games and concerts and have as many people as we want in the church. But going back to that normal also means we are okay with people losing their health care when they lose their job during a global health crisis. Going back to that normal means being okay with the police murdering those of us with darker skin who they should protect and serve, with little more than a slap on the wrist for a consequence. Going back to that normal means that we continue to live in a society where billionaires have fortunes that depend on having millions of employees who are paid so little that the government needs to help them pay rent and buy groceries. All those problems with our society won't go away when the pandemic is finally over. As we wait for the pandemic to end, we shouldn't be passively waiting for all our society's injustices to go back to normal, swept under the rug that the pandemic pulled aside. 
Instead, we are called to use this time of waiting to strengthen our spiritual gifts. Paul specifically names the spiritual gifts of speech and knowledge. So use this time to educate yourself about systemic racism and the oppressive inequalities in our systems of health care and housing and wages. And when we are finished waiting in our homes, fighting this virus that attacks our bodies, I pray that we will have strengthened ourselves to use our speech and knowledge to fight the viruses of racism, injustice, and inequality that have so long been attacking us all, dividing us when we should all be coming together as one. Because the truth is that we are already one, the body of Christ here in the world. We don't need to wait for Christ to come again and fix the world. He is already here. We are his body. We are his army of angels. So instead of spending the rest of this pandemic waiting, spend it preparing to go out into the world and bring about the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. My Lord, when you come at the end of the age and the stars begin to fall, may you hear us and all Christians shouting to proclaim your good news of peace and justice to all the world. In your holy name we pray. Amen.